Well, hey there, it's Liz Rohr from Real World NP, and you're watching NP Practice Made Simple, the weekly videos to help save you time, frustration, and help you learn faster so you can take the best care of your patients. So in this video, I'm gonna be talking about the top differential diagnoses and when it comes to vaginitis, how to know the differences between them, and then the main treatments uh, going forward. A lot of clinical pearls as well as pitfalls. Two important notes though before I jump in. Number one is that there's a cheat sheet that goes along with this video, so you can pause, download it now if you haven't already, print it out, keep it at your desk, easy reference goes along with all the topics that we're talking about here a little bit uh, a little bit more information there as well and then the second note is that the lab interpretation crash course for new nurse practitioners opens next week and I'm super excited so if you're struggling with labs either as a brand new grad or if you've been in practice for a while it goes over the main labs in primary care so CBC CMP TSH lipids urinalysis and then a brand new endocrine module that's the main topics in primary care including low testosterone and PCOS things like that so if you're interested in joining us head over to realworldnp.com com slash labs. You can hop on the wait list and then you'll get an email uh, when enrollment opens. It's only open a couple times a year, so definitely head over there if you're interested. So a lot of your information is going to come from the history. I don't know where this quote came from that 80% of your diagnosis comes from history, but I find that it's totally true. And so specific to vaginitis, I'm, I'm looking down here at my notes so I don't forget anything. One of the things about it is that it's a very sensitive topic and a lot of people are really embarrassed not only to be there for that problem, but to disclose a lot of information about it. And so especially patients will wait a really long time before they actually get care for it because they're typically prioritizing other people. And that's a gross general generalization, but it happens so often. Or they're just too embarrassed to come in, you know, those kinds of things. So I'll, I'll always offer that as an option. So how long has it been going on for? Days, weeks, months, you know, longer than that. Um, just so I don't make them feel embarrassed and they also feel safe enough to disclose that. Another thing is that I offer the typical symptoms that I'm looking for because sometimes people don't want to talk about it either. So is there odor? Is there itching? Is it just discharge? Do they have abdominal pain? Um, do they have burning when they pee? Like things like that. And then a couple of other touchy history questions, but it's really important that you ask all of these because it's very informative. One of them um, is, has this happened before? How often has it happened? Is it recently? Because then you're kind of getting into the area of like recurrent infections and recurrent infections are treated a little bit differently than other ones. Sexual health history, getting a, a comprehensive sexual health history as possible. So I definitely plan on making another video specifically about that because there's, I don't feel like nationally or maybe even internationally, we're doing a very good job talking about this as a topic. And it, especially as a brand new grad can be very uncomfortable. And I typically always blush when I'm talking about it anyway with patients. And that's fine because you know it's better to ask than to not ask um, and the more comfortable you can be with asking those particular questions the more comfortable they're going to be and the less like sheepish you're going to be about it but anyway to be continued i plan on making another video about that um, privately so definitely hang out on the uh, email list if you're interested in watching that one you always want to ask about the use of contraceptives you know are they taking oral contraceptives do they have an iud because that can definitely have some impact on uh, vaginitis or recurrent vaginitis um, using use of panty liners. And so maybe this is just the populations that I've been working with, but I think a lot of people use panty liners every single day, which can reduce the airflow uh, in the area would predispose people to things like BV. I always ask about soaps that they're using, any scented things that they're douching at all, like all of that stuff can throw off the pH um, vaginally. And then have they used any over-the-counter treatments so far? So have they used like a, um, like a yeast treatment suppository uh, because that's gonna impact uh, your testing and your treatment going forward. And then one other thing to think about, if it's very classic or they're very um, forthcoming with their symptoms, this might not be a, something you have to ask about, but sometimes if it's really unclear, you want to ask like, you know, are your symptoms more on the outside? Are they on the inside? Is it the whole thing? Like you can kind of like figure out exactly what's going on. So, cause when it comes to the differential diagnosis, there's like a, a top three that are most common, but the, the actual list laundry list is really long of possible options. So top diagnoses, um, you probably learned a lot of this in school, but this is gonna be hopefully a refresher and a very practical hands-on way to um, really incorporate this in your practice. And so the top ones that are seen in primary care are bacterial vaginosis, yeast, uh, trichomonas, those are the top three infectious ones. The ones that I see additionally are foreign bodies, so things like retained tampons, uh, and then uh, cervicitis you always wanna think about, and pref uh, 
keep wanting to say peripheral arterial disease, but uh, pelvic inflammatory disease. Whenever you're thinking about sexually transmitted infections, you always want to think about PID as well. And cervicitis doesn't necessarily cause a vaginitis, but it can cause a nonspecific vaginal discharge that you would only kind of figure out based on their history of symptoms and then their physical exam. So diagnosis. So how do you approach diagnosis? So it's really important to get that um, comprehensive sexual health history to assess their risk for sexually transmitted infections and consider doing that as part of your workup if they are at risk. However, the, the steps kind of going forward, there's some really simple tools that you can use to really help you, especially if you don't have access to testing. And so when it comes to the top three, BV, trichomonas, and uh, yeast, so a couple things can really help you. First one is pH. And so if you have pH paper, what you can do is just test the pH of the vaginal secretions and is it high? normal or low. So if it's on the higher side that's more consistent with BV and trichomonas, they basically look exactly the same, fortunately or unfortunately. Very similar treatments as well. Whereas yeast is slightly on the lower side. Versus if it's normal, one other thing that I didn't mention in the differentials is that it's likely it could be normal because I'm very passionate about women's health for a number of reasons, but I get really fired up talking about lack of understanding and knowledge and shame when it comes to these type of issues. And so people don't necessarily know what physiologic discharge is. So that's something to kind of consider in your differential diagnosis. You might need to kind of do some education there. Um, but the pH paper is, your, is a great first step and they can kind of point you in one direction or the other. The next one is using potassium hydroxide, the KOH, that little tiny bottle. And um, when you have a sample, you can uh, put the, P the KOH bottle on there, breaks open the cells and releases an amine odor, A-M-I-N-E, or a fishy odor, and that will point you in the direction of a BV or a trichomonas. Whereas if it doesn't have that amine odor, it's less likely to be that one. So stepping back a little bit, there's something called AMSOL's criteria, which will sound real fancy if you talk about it like that. But that's basically um, the criteria that you can use to diagnose BV clinically, meaning just looking at a patient physically, doing their physical exam. So one is like a thin, whitish, grayish discharge. Two is a high pH. Three is the amine odor when using that KOH with test. And then four is clue cells on microscopy. And so you might not necessarily feel comfortable with microscopy or have access to that. So if you have those first three, then that is suggestive of BV. When it comes to yeast, um, technically a low pH is consistent with that. It may also have like a whitish clumpy appearance in terms of discharge on physical exam. However, to technically to diagnose it, you're supposed to be able to see it on culture. You'll definitely see a lot of real world practice, people diagnosing it just by looking at it and based on their symptoms, there's itching and stuff like that, and it doesn't have the other signs and symptoms of BV, then people will treat it kind of clinically without that test. Um, I think two possible two pitfalls I want to want you to be aware of. One is that um, BV can present as a whitish clumpy discharge and have that positive amine odor and not have any um, yeast in there. Fun fact, I've seen that a number of times. Uh, and then two is that when people talk about testing, they don't necessarily know what to test. So what tests can you do if you're not doing that clinical diagnosis? One, it depends on the lab that you work with, but there's specific a vaginitis panel that requires its own type of swab. And I can't really talk to that because there are so many different laboratories, but that's something you wanna think about going forward. People will, I've definitely seen this pitfall, a lot of people sending out a regular like aerobic culture tube. It's like a red top or a blue top. And thinking if they send that out for a culture, when it comes back as something like Gardnerella, that's going to be consistent with bacterial vaginosis, but that is not the case. Um, BV is just a dysbiosis, an imbalance of the normal flora, and so you cannot diagnose it with an aerobic culture. It could be suggestive that Gardnerella predominance could be consistent with BV, however, please don't use it, <laughs> that type of tube. So, but the good news is if you use the KOH and you use the pH paper, you're, you're well on your way to, to making that diagnosis. When it comes to trichomonas, it's very similar to BV. All this information is in the handout down below if you feel like this is like, whoa, way too much information. But trichomonas, the main differentiator is that you can see those, those little guys on uh, microscopy if you do microscopy, but you can also do one of those um, nucleic amplification tests or those rapid antigen tests. There are rapid tests that you can do in the clinic. They're about they're mostly, they're mostly sensitive and specific. So yeah, when it comes to the main treatment, I mean, the differential list is actually quite a lot longer than that, but again, it's on that cheat sheet down below. And if it's not, if it's not matching up those classic ways of, of your first pass of either yeast or BV or trichomonas or a cervicitis of some kind or a foreign body, then you can kind of take those next paths forward 
And then always catching yourself and being like, is this normal? Is this physiologic discharge? Do I need to educate them on normal odor, normal appearance, et cetera, et cetera? Especially, uh, I mean, it actually doesn't matter how old the person is. I find a lot of younger adults need that kind of education and knowledge, but it doesn't matter how old they are, quite honestly. So the main treatment is really just dependent on what we're talking about. So when it comes to bacterial vaginitis, vaginosis, there's a couple different treatments. There's topical metronidazole and then there's oral metronidazole. And those are both... Uh, first line, and I, I just give patients the option because it's their bodies and they get to control them. So do, would you prefer a cream or would you prefer a pill? Keeping in mind that with oral metronidazole, you're technically supposed to avoid uh, alcohol 24 hours before and 48 hours after the entire course uh, to prevent this kind of like anti-abuse type of vomiting effect. Doesn't happen with everybody, but I always warn people of that. The the main benefit of doing oral metronidazole is that if you're not testing for trichomonas, you could potentially cover them for trichomonas. Trichomonas is typically like a one-time two-gram dose of metronidazole or a week long of twice a day. However, keeping in mind, if you're not treating the partner of somebody, then they can get it right back again. If you feel like it is trichomonas, you really should test for it. The other thing to think about when it comes to yeast, um, there are a couple of first line options. They're all the azole antifungals basically, and you can either do the oral kind or you can do the topical kind. And there isn't necessarily one that's better than the other. I typically go based on insurance. Keeping in mind that myconazole, which is the one that's typically over the counter, can burn for some people. Some people have no problem with it, but some people it burns. And then fluconazole is the oral main first line oral regimen. You can either do like a one time pill or uh, one time one pill over the course of uh, a couple of days it's all in the cheat sheet down below but um the main thing to think about with that is uh, it can interact with a number of medications. So uh, just kind of keeping that one in mind. So hopefully uh, hopefully that was helpful. Let me know if you have any questions or if there's any particular topics you want to hear about. Again, I'll be definitely be working on that sexual health history at some point. But yeah, if you're interested in uh, the lab interpretation crash course, don't forget to sign up at realworldmp.com slash labs. It's coming up super soon and I'm super excited for it. I'd love to have you. Um, thank you so much for watching. Hang in there and I'll see you soon.